Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our attendees joining us today for this latest Data Science Central webinar. This is Sean Welch, your host. I'm the host and producer at Data Science Central. I'd like to start our event off today by thanking Pachyderm for sponsoring today's event. Pachyderm is a longtime supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we're honored to have them sponsoring our event today. Today's webinar is entitled, AI versus Unstructured Data, Best Practices for Scaling Video AI, to be presented by Pachyderm. And before we begin, I'd like to briefly, re briefly review the format of today's webinar. Today's event will be one hour long. We have one presenter who will introduce in just a minute, and there will be a 10 to 15 minute Q&A following the presentation. And this event is being recorded and will be available on datasciencecentral.com later this afternoon following today's live event. I'd also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. We will be reviewing and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Vincent Koops with RTL Netherlands. Vincent is an AI researcher and composer, holding degrees in sound design and music composition from the HKU University of the Arts, Utrecht, and degrees in artificial intelligence from the Utrecht University. After a research internship at Carnegie Mellon University, he completed his PhD in music information retrieval at Utrecht University. Currently, he is a senior data scientist at RTL Netherlands, working on AI multimedia projects. He is responsible for developing a scalable video intelligence platform to make video content more discoverable, searchable, and valuable. He develops AI solutions to automatically analyze music and video content, automatically generate movie trailers for different devices, and methods to automatically pick thumbnails for video content for the VOD platform Videoland. Vincent is also a co-organizer of the International AI Song Contest, in which teams compete to write a song with AI. Thanks for being with us today, Vincent. We're looking forward to your presentation. A common challenge for teams working on video machine learning applications is how to scale and automate their ML lifecycle when working with these types of large unstructured data sets. In today's Data Science Central webinar, Vincent Koops, senior data scientist at RTL Netherlands, will walk through their video AI platform at RTL and how they've addressed these challenges. Their platform is built on top of Pachyderm and Kubernetes to enable a wide range of ML applications, such as automatic thumbnail picking and mid-roll marking. Today, you will learn how to take a modular approach to creating a scalable and automated ML platform, the challenges and best practices when working with unstructured data like video clips, and considerations your teams need to make to prevent human error while getting the most out of AI and ML. Vincent, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You can begin as soon as you're ready to go. Thank you very much, Sean, for that uh, kind introduction. Yeah, so today I wanted to talk about um, video AI and our approach to it at RTL Netherlands. But before I do that, I wanted to give a, a, a quick introduction to who we are and uh, where I work. So I work at RTL Netherlands and um, RTL Netherlands is part of Bertelsmann. This is the logo on top on, on the left side. So Bertelsmann is, a, is an international uh, media company um, Penguin Random House and BMG, the record company, are part of it, for example. And um, part of Bertelsmann is R RTL Group, and RTL Netherlands is part of RTL Group. And RTL Netherlands, um, we are the largest commercial, commercial broadcaster in the Netherlands. And uh, we have um, linear TV channels, um, of which we um, have about 28% audience share. We have AVOT and ASVOT. Uh, channels of which RTL Excel and Videoland are the largest. So Videoland is basically our Netflix competitor in the Netherlands. And we have uh, other brands like weather channels like Bioradar and um, are, uh, a, a very large uh, news um, organization as well. So with our linear television, we reach about 9 million, peoples, 9 million people a day. 
and with our online video, about uh, 780 online views per month um, and some 2.3 million unique visitors across our digital publishing uh, efforts. So I'm part of uh, the data science team. So we have about six data scientists in our team. And you can imagine with, uh, um, with all these channels and all these uh, digital channels, we gather a lot of interesting, uh, a ton of, of interesting data that needs to be analyzed. So we do uh, a wide range of, of things like forecasting, uh, uh, ratings on television, but also on um, video on demand. Uh, we build our recommendation systems. We do research into robot journalism, and we also publish um, uh, robot journalism articles. And so we also do uh, uh, video AI. And um, in this call, we also have Dan Odak, who is the lead data scientist of our team, who is also available at the end of the call to take some questions. All right. So there are basically three things that I wanted to discuss in this talk. So first is the is video AI at RTL. What is our vision and what do we mean with that? And what are we actually trying to solve? And the second thing is how do we or how we how do we put it into practice with Pachyderm? And then I wanted to zoom in into two use cases uh, that I think uh, nicely show um, what we we are capable of with our solution. So the first one is um, AI thumbnail selection. So picking the right images or thumbnails on our video on demand platform. And the second one is um, deciding where to place an ad um, on our video demand platform content. All right, our vision at RTL Netherlands um, when it comes to artificial intelligence is basically that we want to use it to make sure we optimally use our human intelligence. So we want to, put it into practice where um, humans are, are, we wanna facilitate what humans are good at. So being creative, associate freely, and connect to the hearts and minds of our fans. So we want to use artificial intelligence to boost that or help our creative people to basically uh, be better at what they're doing, more creative. Um, because most of the things that we deal with with our video video AI applications have to do with content operations. And um, the content operations is hard, first of all, because it's labor intensive work. Um, it's just hard work to make something, um, to make videos, to edit videos. But it also takes a lot of human creativity, which is of course really hard to uh, replace uh, with AI. Um, but um, but that we can help with AI, that we can bring to a next level with AI. So some of the things that we we um, we try to do or that we are doing at at RT Netherlands is, for example, automatic promo, uh, automatic promo and trailer generation. So that means from a movie, can we automatically um, select the right scenes, put them in the right order, and create a promo or trailer? Um, for TV or for video on demand. Um, another thing is, can we um, help our video ed editors by automatically spotting which part of the content might be interesting for them? So basically um, knowing what no happens where in a video and providing that information to the editors so they can quickly find content in the video or across videos that they that helps in the, in their editing process, and then there's intelligent cropping of images and videos. So how can we, if we have some video content, automatically make it um, in the right aspect ratio for um, Instagram, for example, where you want to have a square aspect ratio compared to um, a Facebook Facebook where you want to have the five to four aspect ratio, for example. Just some examples that we that we um, try to tackle as a with a video AI. Now these things are highly complicated, of course. These are very um, if you would want to build one model that solves each of these problems, you 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 get a, a really large model that's really hard to to manage. Um, so 
creating an end-to-end, -end, one single end-to-end -end model that solves these issues or these problems is not a very, very good idea. So what we do is we take a modular approach to machine intelligence. So what we do is we take these complex computational tasks and we divide them into simpler subtasks. So instead of creating uh, task specific models, such as a model that takes this input a video and outputs a trailer, for example, we break down these problems or these tasks into very simple and, and basically solved approaches or, or things that, that are, are, can be um, approached very well by artificial intelligence. And we use those elements in an intelligent way so that we can solve these, these complex tasks. Um, and the, um, the approach that we take and this, this package that we, we created, this, uh, uh, this approach we call video pipe. So this is basically our uh, artificial intelligence products pipeline. And we can use that to create new RTL content. So these are trailers and promos, for example. Um, but we can also make existing content more discoverable and valuable because we learn more from the content and we can use all those insights in, in, uh, in other aspects of where the content is distributed and used. All right, so um, we can extract a lot of information from a video. So a video, uh, of course, consists of, of separate um, streams of information. So there's a visual domain, there's an audio domain, and there's a text domain. And we created models um, for each of these aspects that basically try to solve a relatively simple task, although some of those are still um, quite hard problems, but um, simple enough that we can um, use them um, 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 with care and that we know what the output is and that we can recombine them in an interesting way. So in the visual domain, for example, we can do uh, keyframe extraction. So we know, for example, uh, what a good frame is from uh, a shot in a movie. We can do shot segmentation. So we can automatically cut up a video that, so that we basically have all the separate shots that make up the entire video. Uh, we can compute optical flow so we can get a sense of how fast a shot is moving, for example. Uh, we have models for aesthetics and analysis. So we know how pretty something is that it, that's on screen. Um, uh, a visual similarity um, analysis can tell us where content uh, repeats within content. So for example, bumpers or credits uh, who that appear across videos. So in that sense, we can detect where the, where the credit starts or where the bumpers are. Um, and we can do face detection and emotion recognition and, and object detection and a lot of other things. Um, and then in the audio domain, we can do audio tagging. So we know uh, whether there's a dog barking or a car, or a car driving by. Um, we could do speaker segmentation and identification. So we know who is speaking where and with what emotion. And if there's music uh, in, the, in a movie, for example, we, we can also analyze that to get a sense of the uh, musical genre or the mood that's uh, uh, part of that scene. Usually with video, there's also text data related to that. Um, so subtitles or a script, those kind of things. And we have models to analyze that text data. So we can do language detection. Um, we can do sentiment analysis. Uh, we can analyze the key phrases. We can automatically summarize uh, these scripts um, and tons of other things. Um, but I wanted to show here is that from all these different streams that make up a video, we can extract all these uh, really interesting aspects that are basically um, single modules that solve one particular task. Um, and now to, if we wanna solve more complex tasks, of course we wanna combine these things in, in some kind of way. Um, all right, and what we use for that is Pachyderm. So all these models that I just showed before, um, we use Pachyderm to scale these, to orchestrate these, and to solve a more complex task uh, using these modules. Um, because, um, Pachyderm gives us uh, um, 
um, the opportunity or gives us uh, facilitates us to uh, to create these flexible solutions from simpler models, and uh, especially because it's data driven and code agnostic. So um, with data driven, I mean that it's basically the video data in our case that basically um, uh, starts a computation and, and starts uh, computing all these aspects with these uh, uh, smaller modules um, downstream. And I'll give an example of that further on in the presentation. What's also important for us is reproducibility. So in our case, that, uh, that means versioning. Um, so we want to track when we extract da data or metadata from a video or, or other kinds of interesting things, uh, where that was computed from, but also if we have a new video that is maybe a, a re-edit of a video that was analyzed before, that we can um, put it into video pipe again and get updated output. But we can still go back to the old output um, and go back and see what the output was there to learn from it, um, but also be able to, to step back if the, other, if the previous video uh, turned out to be um, a better one, for example. Um, then scalability is also very important for us because video data is big data. So um, as you can imagine, uh, a high quality video uh, often uh, commonly has 25 frames per second of, of high quality images. Um, so scheduling uh, and scaling uh, these pipelines is, is very important to us. And then with parallel processing, we can also analyze tons of videos at the same time. Um, we get a lot of content sent in every day and we don't wanna be restricted by just be able to, to analyze one video at a time. We wanna, if there's a lot of videos coming in, we wanna analyze them basically all at the same time. And with Pachyderm, uh, we can do that. So we also use other products in, the, in, the, in, in other parts of our organization, or that we also have uh, parts of VideoPipe uh, running in Argo workflows, for example. Um, and this also allows us to schedule pipelines, which works really well for us in, the, in some situations. And it can also account for this modularity aspect. Um, but it, it cannot really account for this uh, reproducibility um, aspect. Um, and um, we have uh, um, we have tried some other solutions uh, in the past, and we and we are working. For example, we we also have solutions with DVC, where we can use uh, um, um, that. Uh, that's also a solution for data versioning. But it, uh, in this case, the the benefit of, of Pachyderm for us is that all of these features are are highly coupled in one product, which is uh, uh, which works really well for us. All right, so this was uh, part of the vision um, and the idea behind uh, VideoPipe and, and our, our video AI approach. Now I wanted to show how we actually put it into practice. So, um, and I wanted to do this um, using, um, by going basically through our GitHub repo and basically show you what's in there, um, but because I think it really nicely shows what we have and what we use and what are the elements that are important for us. So there are two things that are very important in, in VideoPipe. So that's uh, on the first place, a data model, which allows us to merge the output of these individual um, uh, modules and basically gives us the, uh, or facilitates us to make these more complex models. And then we have our pipelines, which are the individual modules in essence. All right, let's look at the data model first. So what the data model is, is, is it gives us a way to um, make sure that the output of every pipeline, so of every module is basically the same. It is defined in a similar way um, so that we can easily combine the output of different outputs or different modules. Say, for example, you, when we have a, a face recognition pipeline running, and we also have um, a speech recognition pipeline running um, that basically tells us who is speaking. So it's, it's a speaker identification pipeline. And we wanna combine these two things. 
we want to make sure that the output is defined uh, on the same um, dimension. So this can be on frame level, for example. So, and, and this data model uh, gives us uh, exactly that. So we can uh, make sure the output of the face detection model is on the frame level. So we know in each frame, uh, for each frame, we know which face is in there. And then for the speaker uh, recognition model, we also know per frame, for example, uh, who is speaking. And then combining that data, we now know uh, who is speaking where on which frame or which or which faces are correlating with with uh, with what speech, um, which gives us a lot of more uh, uh, possibilities than these individual steps. So this is very important for uh, for video pipe. Um, and basically what it shows or what it contains is uh, the name of the pipeline, uh, the, the video source so that we can um, um, trace back um, where this content came from, from what which, which video, and then some other metadata like frames per second duration. We have a data version. If we have an upgrade of this data model, um, we can um, we can increase this uh, this number so that we know that this is a newer version. Um, some shape data about the the video, and then um, um, a dimension across which this data is extracted. So in, this could be on a seconds level, on a frame level, or a span level. So it so that is, for example, it starts at second X and ends at seconds Z. Um, so the data is defined in that span. And then there's the data itself, of course. All right. The second really important part of uh, a video pipe are the pipelines, of course. These are the building blocks um, that gives us the power to solve these complex problems. And basically all the pipelines are similar in a way. Like the uh, what we have is roughly three or four things. So what we always have is a Docker file. So in this Docker file is basically it tells us um, uh, what the base image is, or what the image is that we're using to, to do our comp computations. Then we have some code. So in this case, it's a, it's a Python file. It's a frame extraction Python file. And this, this code is extracted inside this uh, uh, container or this pod that is spun up and uh, is using that Docker file. And then there's the pipeline definition uh, according to the pachyderm specs. Um, and I'll go through each of these uh, in the next uh, slides. Um, so there's also requirements here, but this is only for, because in this case, it's it's Python code, we install these requirements in this Docker file. But since it's code agnostic, um, we could easily have like R code in here, or we also use bash scripts, so we don't have this requirements file at all. Um, it can, can be whatever, as long as it runs in this Docker file, and it creates the right, right output, um, then it works. All right, so the first thing I wanted to show is this Docker file. It's really simple. We created a base image that, that basically contains some, um, uh, some code and some, some data that we just want to have there in all cases, just to run tests uh, and also to have the, um, the data model in there. So to make sure that the data model is in each of the uh, available in each of the pods that is running in VideoPipe, we use this base image. Then we copy some the, the data. So in, in line two and three, we install some packages that are needed. So f of mpeg, of course, is important when you want to do video editing. Um, do we install packages with pip? Um, and that's basically it. Then we have our, our uh, our Docker file with which we can build our container. And in this container, we're gonna run code, of course. So in this case, I wanted to show you um, a face detection pipeline. So on the left, there's a bunch of code. If you wanna pause and look through, like, look through the code, you can do that. Uh, but I wanted to take a more high level approach. So on the right, I made this diagram that basically shows you what's, what's happening in the code. Um, so in this case, um, this, the preceding step here is that uh, we had a uh, we have a pipeline that's extracting frames, right? And it's extracting frames and it's putting them in a folder 
that has the name of the video file. So now this pipeline, which runs next, so this is the, the face detection pipeline that you're, that you're looking at, it basically runs for all these folders, it gets all the images in the folder, detects all the faces on all the images, and then puts that output in the data model, and then saves that data model plus some logging files and some 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 other things to make that for so that we can make sure that everything ran correctly, and saves that to the output repository. And in this case, it, it runs this every time the preceding pipeline uh, has finished. So we detect basically all faces on all images for all videos that we extracted frames from. And that's basically all. So it's a it's quite simple, compact, uh, uh, small pipeline uh, that solves one particular task. All right, and the last thing that's very important is this pipeline definition. So this is a pachyderm pipeline definition um, that makes sure that it picks the right Docker images and runs the right code. So in this case, what I show you here is a frame extraction pipeline. Uh, it has a description, description, it extracts frames, of course. Um, and in the transform part, you can see what it is uh, actually running. So it runs this command, it runs Python, this frame extraction uh, Python file, and it takes as input uh, a videos repository. So PFS slash videos. Um, uh, it's a videos repository and it writes all its output to PFS slash out, um, uh, which is uh, basically the data model and the log files. It writes it there. Uh, it pulls an image. So we have an image here that does that. Does that. It does frame extraction. It contains the, the code uh, that's mentioned in the line above that. There's some, uh, some secrets in there um, to make sure that we can pull the image. Um, and then what's important on line 11, we define that the input, uh, it takes as input the, the videos repository. So this just makes sure that we can access um, the data that we want, in this case, the videos. All right. So this is this was the general setup and just an example of, of the, the, the parts that we use um, to create more complex uh, tasks or to solve more complex tasks, sorry. Um, because what I showed you uh, until now uh, were relatively simple, tiny parts um, that of course we wanna combine. And I think these two use cases um, will show, um, will give a nice overview of what we can solve by combining different elements. So the first one I wanted to go into is AI thumbnail selection. And the second one is add mid-roll marking. Uh, and add thumbnail, uh, AI thumbnail selection is basically this problem. So this is um, uh, the web interface of our uh, video on um, video on demand platform. And we also have uh, keeping up with the Kardashians, as you can see. And uh, this is season 15. So, but for all these um, um, uh, videos in this in this season, we need a thumbnail to show you what is what is going on in the video, or um, uh, that basically tells you like this is an interesting episode. You might want to click on this to watch it. All right, so those are these images. And the way this uh, this was done in the past at RTL was that uh, a designer would basically scroll through all the possible frames that are in a video, would scroll through it and try to find one that looks nice. So this has a, a couple of problems, of course, right? There is too much information here. Um, uh, there are a lot of frames that are similar to each other. There's, so there's a lot of um, uh, information here that's not necessary to have. Um, and also, th there's probably a, a lot of images here that um, uh, that are quite obvious that they're not useful for for uh, for using as a thumbnail. And we learn from our from our designers. We ask them what what makes a good image on the, on Videoland. What what should it have? So they told us it needs um, one to three faces. Uh, it needs a certain color. Um, um, combination. It needs to be in focus, of course. 
it shouldn't contain any spoilers, um, those kind of things. And a lot of these things are actually uh, separately are, are problems that we can solve with, with AI. So what we build is basically this combination of pipelines that, that solves this problem or helps, uh, helps the designers in solving this problem. So, and I'll walk you through it from, from left to right. So all the way in the left, you see um, um, uh, origins of content. So this can be um, Azure, a blob store, uh, or somewhere on S3 or some other, some other way we can gather videos, but they end up in the videos repository. So this is the first repository where all the videos land. So from all these videos, we do frame extraction. Uh, so we, depending a little bit on the length of the video, but we extract the videos every um, every second or so. Or if it's a if it's a shorter video, we extract more frames. And from these frames, we do face detection. Uh, we have a model for aesthetics analysis, um, so we know how pretty the image is. We do some technical analysis. Um, for example, uh, is it in focus or is it? Uh, um, yeah, is, is the color balance correct? Those kind of things. And we have a couple of other um, pipelines that extract information from these frames. And using this uh, data model that I explained before, we can easily combine all that information and make some really interesting choices. Um, because if we, if we combine them, then we can basically in one view uh, look at, okay, which image has two faces, has a particular aesthetics ranking, uh, is in focus, um, and also has a particular actor, for example. All that information we can use, and we can rank the images and basically push what the AI thinks or what this ranking thinks is the best image. We can push that automatically to Videoland. Um, so this solves two, uh, this, this ranking basically solves two problems. Uh, one, we can automatically push the best image to Videoland. So basically when a video is, is available, it will run through this pipeline and uh, a thumbnail is published automatically, which saves a lot of time. Um, but secondly, uh, using this ranking, we can also give the, the designers uh, a top five or top 10 of images. Um, so if the number one ranked image um, is perhaps not good enough or the designer thinks there are better images, they can pick another one from this list and basically select maybe the second or the third one in the, li in the list. However, uh, we actually see that 99% of all AI selected stills are used on Videoland and they're not actually not touched by the, by the editors. And using these pipelines, this combination of pipelines, we actually uh, created a reduction of over a thousand working hours per year. All right, so the second example that I wanted to show you is add mid-roll marking. Um, so Videoland has a basic tier subscription, um, which basically means you can watch the content, but you also have to watch ads. Um, and we wanna monetize the, the content that we have optimally, of course. So what we want basically is to place ads in the least intrusive parts of videos. So, um, uh, this is limited by some business rules, of course, but it should be an ad around every 20 minutes or so. Um, but there should be no ads during speech or conversation. And it it is preferred to place the ads on scene boundaries. Um, and uh, these things we can uh, we can solve with uh, with VideoPipe. Um, again, this is the, uh, the the overview of the the selection of the. Uh, the parts of the pipelines that we use for solving this problem. So, and again, on the left, you see where the uh, the origin of the videos, so Azure S3 or somewhere else, we put them in a videos repository. And we have a couple of models um, running here that extract information from these videos that we can use to solve this, this problem. So we do shot detection, for example. So we know where uh, one shot uh, transfers into another and we can cut the video on those parts. We know where those cuts are. Um, and we do that by um, 
by looking at color histograms, for example. So when a color histogram changes from frame to frame in subsequent, subsequent frames, we know that there's a high probability that there's a shot boundary. Uh, we can do speech gap detection because as I mentioned, it's very important to put ads where there's no speech. It's very annoying to, to watch, um, watch content and then have an ad uh, put right in the middle of somebody speaking, like right in the middle of a sentence. That's very annoying. Then we have a couple of business rules. Um, this depends a little bit on the content. Some content, as I mentioned, um, should be an ad every 20 minutes. If it's shorter content, it should be, it should maybe the only one one uh, ad. And it also depends on the producer. They can put um, restrictions on the amount or the um, or the frequency of ads. So uh, with these business rules, we can uh, uh, we can use that to to correctly serve the correct amount of ads, and then we have a couple of other pipelines that help in this process as well. But again, uh, using the data model, we can combine all the information from all these pipelines uh, to make uh, the choice that makes this a successful um, application. Uh, so in this case, we know. We can look at where the shots uh, uh, intersect with the with the gaps in the speech, so we can know where to put these ads. So, to put this a little bit more uh, visual, so as I said, the shot boundary detection basically uh, uh, looks at color histograms. So, if you uh, in this image, if you look from top to bottom, this is the time axis, um, and then um, I place the horizontal line on where the shot boundary is. So you see on the top left, you see some purple colors, and then it switches to more um, beige colors. Um, and at this, when there's a big switch like this in colors, we know that there's a, a, a shot boundary. And the same in the middle, in the top, you see a completely different color distribution than, um, than on the third image compared to the second one in the middle. So we also know that there's a, a shot boundary, same in the last row. Uh, and, and we can actually improve this um, by also looking at faces, for example, um, and at a higher level also in a similar way, combined with other information, also detect the scene boundaries. So this is a little more, a scene is, is uh, comprised of different shots, of course. All right, and then if we combine all this information, we can, uh, we can actually determine where to place an ad. So what I've, try to visualize here is, is uh, the speech. So what we do in the speech gap detection is that from the video, we extract the audio. And from the audio channel, we can split the audio into the speech part and the rest part, basically. So this is the music, background sounds, uh, dogs barking, um, uh, cars driving around, these kind of things. But basically speech versus the rest. And from the speech channel, uh, we can analyze the intensity, right? So what you see here, the blue line, um, basically shows you the intensity of the speech. So basically how loud is the speech at a particular moment in time? And we can create a threshold or we can set a threshold, I should say. And we can say above this threshold, we, we think this is significant amount of speech. And below this threshold, um, we don't consider it to be speech. Uh, and this, if you threshold it, you see this uh, orange line, um, uh, we can turn it into a binary um, signal. Um, so you see that the uh, the high blue lines <clears throat> uh, correlate with uh, uh, the binary values of one in this, uh, in this signal. So everywhere where the orange line is one, there's a uh, speech. And this gives us the, uh, uh, the opportunity to look at where large gaps are. So you see um, those gaps annotated here. Um, so we can say, okay, everything that's um, longer than uh, half a second, for example, we consider that to be a gap or longer than a second. Um, and this way we can identify where the speech gaps are. And then using that uh, data model, we can, we can super easily combine and create one view of the data that's in that's the output of shot boundaries, speech gaps, and also the business rules. Um, and what we can do here is then 
Um, I've, I've visualized four examples here of which only the second one is a, is a correct one. But you see the first one, um, there is a, a shot boundary, there's a correct shot boundary, it, but there is speech in there. You see that the, the orange line is a, is, is a, has a high value, it's one. And then uh, the second uh, line, vertical line, you see that there's a, a big gap there and there's also a shot boundary. So this is a, a good place to place an ad or a, a candidate to place an, place an ad. And then you have um, the other two examples. Uh, there's a speech gap, but there's no sh shot boundary. Um, and again, and the last example is, uh, is the same. Um, and this combining this information is, so it's, it's uh, um, makes it possible from these relatively simple models to combine them to solve these more complex tasks, so, such as these. All right. So I hope what I try to show here in this in this talk is that um, basically our idea around video AI at RTL, our vision, but also that using Pachyderm, we can create and scale these complex artificial intelligence solutions um, by using simple and small reusable mo modules. Um, uh, and, and Pachyderm gives us a really nice way of, uh, of doing this. Well, Vincent, thanks for that excellent presentation. And we'll get started with today's Q&A session. And I want to thank the audience for their participation. We've got a great many questions that have come in during the presentation, and we'll do our best to get through all of them in the time remaining. And during this Q&A session, I'll leave up this screen with contact information for Vincent. If you'd like to contact him for a copy of the slide deck following today's webinar. All right, let's get started. So the first question is, what other tools or software did the team evaluate before going with Pachyderm? So um, there are a couple of tools that uh, that we looked at, but and there are also other tools that we are using for for VideoPipe. Um, so so one of these is uh, is Argo workflows. Um, so with Argo workflows, we can also orchestrate and and uh, and scale these individual units, so these modules, um, and we can also uh, combine them um, uh, to to basically solve these uh, more complex tasks. Um, uh, but it is a little bit more cumbersome, uh, and and we can you, we can combine Argo workflows with DVC, for example, um, so data versioning, um, which basically solves um, uh, that um, that reprodu reproducibility aspect. Um, yeah, but as I mentioned, the, the the benefit of Pachyderm is that that all of these features are highly coupled in in one product, and and, and the really nice thing also, uh, I think, is is that. Um, uh, data is basically treated as a first-class citizen, uh, where adding data to a repository, basically the input repository, makes sure that everything gets that gets triggered uh, downstream uh, in your DAC or in your collection of pipelines. Uh, and this is a this gives a really nice uh, and really nice traceable way of computing your your output data. Um, again, this these things can be solved with uh, with other tools as well. But uh, we really like uh, this, uh, uh, the Pachyderm approach. Well, thanks for providing that additional context. Uh, the next question is, how does this setup transfer to other domains? For example, would a similar setup work for music? Yes, that's a very nice question. So I, th I think every complex task um, that can be uh, broken down into these uh, smaller units or these smaller modules, can be solved or can be uh, applied in a similar way that uh, that I showed here. Um, so for music, uh, um, so for music analysis, for example, we we do uh, uh, music analysis as well in, in VideoPipe. So this is part uh, of our collection of pipelines where we basically detect the amount of music that's in our content. Um, but you can also imagine that there's another set of pipelines that digs a little bit deeper into this, into the music and detects, for example, what kind of melodies are in there or uh, who is singing or who, who, who uh, what kinds of inter inst instruments are playing. And you can recombine this information to solve a lot of other interesting tasks. So yes, I think it, it, uh, it transfers 
uh, nicely to a lot of other domains, actually, and especially domains that deal with uh, uh, high dimensional complex data, such as video or music. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, the next question is, do you think you would be able to replace human designers and editors at some point? So I, th I think that's um, uh, it's always a little bit of a dangerous uh, thing to say, but I think some things can, can definitely be, uh, um, some things that humans do can be replaced by machines. So AI is capable of doing things that humans can also do. But uh, I, I think it's more interesting to think about how we can use AI to, to help creative people do their job more efficiently or help them um, become more creative or, or, or let them uh, get their creati creativity to a next level using AI. I think that's, that's uh, more interesting and also um, I think necessary because there are things, uh, especially when you're dealing with data that deals with a lot of creativity, there are parts of creativity that are, that are, that you cannot really, um, model with AI at the moment, or possibly never, could never model with AI. Um, and you also need that human um, perspective, I think, to make sure that what you're creating is actually for humans and, and not for, for computers or for, a, for artificial intelligence. So you always need humans, but sure, there are also uh, tasks, uh, some of them who, that might be, um, uh, that the creative people are probably uh, happy that they're that that is solved by a by a model. Um, um, so there will always be parts that will be uh, that can be replaced by AI, but you will also need uh, humans. Understood. Well, Vincent, thank you. Great answers to some very good questions.